Good morning to some of you and good afternoon to others. Uh, I'm Julia Poliskanova and I'm Senior Director with Transport and Environment. On behalf of TE and SAFE's Center for Critical Mineral Strategy, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar on Minerals for Green Transition, how the US and Europe can work together to ensure a sustainable pathway. First, before giving a few minutes to ease ourselves into the discussion, I just would like to remind you of just a few small rules. First of all, this webinar will be recorded and you will, able, you will be able to access it after the show. And secondly, please do uh, think and ask your questions. We will have time for a Q&A uh, after the initial conversation with our speakers today. Uh, so please do use the function below to pose your questions. For decades, uh, the king of materials has been oil. Energy security was all about OPEC, dependence on Russia's gas, etc. Of course, these are still, still very much uh, pertinent issues and, and, and problems. But things like lithium or copper for a very long time were just a problem of uh, mobile phone makers uh, and the ceramics industry. But the things are changing fast. Batteries are the new oil. In the United States, the Biden administration has enacted the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a game changer in metals industrial policy. And in Europe, the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has recently said that lithium and rare earths will soon be more important than oil and gas. And that's why in Europe, we also have the Critical Raw Materials Act that is coming. Why have all these things now become so high up on the agenda? The fight against climate is a race against the clock. Transitioning to renewable energy, efficient buildings, electric vehicles, energy storage rapidly and at an unprecedented scale is essential if we are to have a fleeting chance to actually survive on this planet. Beyond climate, our reliance on fossil fuels also undermines our energy security, as of course the Russia's war in Ukraine has shown once again. So on the one hand, we need a lot more things like copper, nickel, lithium, rare earths in the coming years. And this supply, be it from primary or secondary sources, is not there. Even when it is there, it's often concentrated and is posing geopolitical issues. So ultimately, we don't want another nickel or cobalt OPEC. We need a diversified supply and open markets. So the first key word for today's webinar is resilience. On the other hand, mining has often been marred by conflict, corruption, and environmental problems, higher social and environmental standards, new technologies to extract materials with less impact, circularity, and above all, respect and engagement with local and indigenous communities needs to come hand in hand with new projects. So the second and the last key word for today's webinar is responsible supply. The challenge today, given the speed and the scale, is to combine both and do this uh, thing together, not undermining or trading off one against the other. This challenge is actually shared in the same way by regions such as America and Europe. Both continents need to ensure transparency and sufficient sourcing of critical metals, need to put in place high social and environmental standards, and need to reform the permitting systems, not just to speed up uh, good projects, but also oversee their good implementation. As we often say at Transport and Environment, today when it comes to mining, doing things right is the fastest way to get there, to get your permits, to get the project approved. So here in Europe, in America, uh, we can cooperate, we can learn from each other, we can support each other and also get inspired from each other. And just before in Europe we kick off the European Raw Materials Week, today we're here to share best practice across the, the Atlantic, to hear from each other. We'll hear from the key regulators in the space in both America and Europe. We'll hear also from some of the most progressive companies in this field that are showing that we can do things differently. So without further ado, I would like now to introduce the first uh, speaker who has kindly recorded her remarks for us here today as she wasn't able to participate. 
and it is a member of European Parliament who will be known to many of you working in critical matters in Europe. It's Hildegard Bentele. So I would like to ask her now to play the video that she has recorded for us. These are very interesting and challenging times for critical raw materials value chains. And this webinar is proof of the broad interest in the topic and the need to work jointly with like-minded partners to meet the challenge. With the critical raw material strategy and my parliamentary report on the table, we are now in the process of figuring out how we can implement our strategy fast, efficient and legally binding where necessary. You all know that the Commission is currently consulting on the Critical Raw Materials Act. As you are all experts, you know that our starting point is far from optimal. All studies and forecasts predict a rising demand for critical raw materials necessary for our twin transition, the ecological and digital transformation. Additionally, we face a dependence on only a few countries and companies in the supply of these materials. Furthermore, we are facing challenging geopolitical developments that further increase the risk of disruption. If you recently tried to buy an electric car, you know that delays in supply chains are already the new reality. If you then know that there's a political decision on EU level to allow registration for new cars from 2035 on only if they are electric, and if you further take into consideration that electric cars need six times as many critical raw materials as a conventional car, then only this example from the automotive industry is already putting pressure on us. Our ambition towards climate neutrality is a huge driver for our material demand. Our renewable energy share in 2030 will be 45% instead of 32%. Our solar strategy aims to bring online over 320 gigawatt of solar photovoltaic newly installed by 2025, over twice today's level and almost 600 gigawatt by 2030. We will increase the binding energy efficiency target to 13% by 2030. That is an increase of 4 percentage points compared to plans in 2021. For our hydrogen strategy, we have set new targets of 10 million tons of domestic renewable hydrogen production and 10 million tons of imports by 2030. Energy transition means electrification and electrification demands materials. Rare earth and green steel for windmills, nickel, platinum, titanium, iridium and scandium for electrolyzers. The list goes on and on. I would like to point out that we will always have to import critical raw materials. Everything else would be an illusion. But it is also our responsibility to strengthen our resilience in, on the European continent. How can we do that? We want to build strong secondary markets. We need to understand that waste streams are not garbage, but materials we need to recycle and reuse. This is why we are currently discussing waste streams targets for collection and recycling efficiencies under the battery proposal. At the same time, we are negotiating the Waste Shipment Directive to ensure high standards of waste treatment and to put an end to illegal exports. And at the Sustainable Product Initiative, we will discuss how product design and product information can contribute to a circular economy and a sustainable use of resources. But even if we fully exploit the recycling potential, which will take up to 15 years, by the way, we will continue to need a substantial amount of primary resources. And this is why we need to ensure a secure and affordable access to the raw materials in need. First, we have to further diversify our partnerships with like-minded and reliable partners. Our trade agreements are certainly an important tool, but we also know that it takes a while to accomplish them. This is why we have to complement them on bilateral, by bilateral raw material partnerships in which we agree on stable, long-term cooperation respecting sustainability standards. Second, we cannot afford anymore to leave any option aside. That means we have to seriously address the exploitation of our domestic potential. I'm fully aware of the fact that starting and implementing a mining project in Europe is anything else than trivial and a fast solution. But if you take our aim to increase resilience series, 
as well as our endeavor to achieve sustainability. We have to tackle the issue. And I think the opportunities are bigger than the risks, since in Europe, best available technologies are being applied and social and environmental standards are high. Third, I would like to see strategic projects being implemented in the critical raw material sector at, as it is being done in the battery and in the renewable sector. I was putting forward this idea in my report last year only cautiously, but I was glad to hear that the President of the Commission fully embraces this idea in her State of the Union speech. As you know, strategic European projects profit from efficient and faster permitting and better access to funding. The first point is crucial for mining projects. European strategic projects can showcase our technological expertise and our ability to diligently balance both the EU's increased need for sustainability sourced critical raw materials and the need to protect nature and biodiversity. In that context, we could also implement the Green Deal in the way it was envisaged, namely as an opportunity. An opportunity to transform our mining sector. An opportunity to lead by excellence in technology and innovation and to export this excellence into other parts of the world. Fourth and finally, I think we need to stay technolo technology open as research and innovation are moving fast and substitution can provide alternatives, especially with regard to batteries. Sodium-ion batteries will not need lithium, copper, graphite or cobalt anymore, but the production is very similar to lithium-ion batteries, which means that any current factory could adapt production very easily. Technology will not replace lithium, but will most likely evolve into a low-cost alternative if we can manage the drawbacks coming from lower energy density and less developed chemistry. To strongly support innovation and research is a strong feature of European policy and I belong to those who have a high trust in our European engineers and masterminds. On this optimistic note, I would like to conclude my intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, we thank Ms. Bentele for those remarks. And now I would like to turn to the other side of the Atlantic, uh, to someone many of you, of course, know also very well, someone very core to this very debate around critical metals in, in the United States of America. And I'd like to uh, invite us all to listen to similar recorded remarks for us by the U.S. Senator Joe Manchin. Hello, I'm United States Senator Joe Manchin, Chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the Senior Senator for the great state of West Virginia. Thank you to Transport and Environment and SAFE for all the work you have done to bring attention to our mineral supply chains and for hosting this discussion today. As you all know, we are far too reliant on unreliable sources for the critical materials crucial to our shared economic and national security. Whether it is for an EV battery, or the artillery shells and high-tech equipment vital to our military aid to Ukraine. This conversation is so important right now because we've all been watching in horror as Putin has weaponized Russia's oil and gas to inflict terrible pain on the Ukrainian people. As Putin's war in Ukraine continues to disrupt energy supplies worldwide, the United States and European Union must work together to strengthen our supply chains and ensure energy security. Right now, Russia's actions are of immediate concern, but we should not lose sight of the fact that China has positioned its industry as the gatekeeper of the critical minerals necessary for modern life. At the same time, the European Union recently announced a plan to end the sale of gas and diesel cars by 2035, as have some states here in the U.S. However, these announcements don't change the facts. The battery and rare earth supply chains remain almost entirely reliant on China. While new mines can take a decade or more to get permitted and start producing. When you consider the exponential growth in critical mineral demand and that China is currently responsible for over 80% of the world's battery material processing, the challenge of rapid EV adoption and electrification becomes clear. As we pursue energy security for America and our allies, we cannot continue to put ourselves in a position where we are reliant on bad actors for the key minerals that power our economy. Not only are we encouraging mining and processing with lower environmental standards than we would permit at home, we risk having this dependence weaponized against the US and the EU, particularly by Xi's Chinese Communist Party, 
unless we rapidly make investments in new mining processing and manufacturing so that we can source responsibly and with reliable partners, we are at risk of having battery factories and automakers stand idle as they wait for feedstock that is not coming. Here in the United States, our Congress has passed two historic laws that help address the energy needs of our nation and this supply chain challenge, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. These laws recognize that we don't have to choose between our environment and the economy by investing in technologies and methods to produce all types of energy in the cleanest way possible while growing our domestic energy manufacturing base, especially in coal country. Of course, the investments created by these laws in our energy and mineral supply chains can't be fully realized if projects are held up in the permitting process. This is why comprehensive permitting reform is vital to accelerating projects to deliver for the American people and our allies around the world. I am determined to find a bipartisan path forward to meet the challenges of delivering affordable, reliable energy to Americans and our global partners while bringing new, reliable supply chains online. I hope that we can continue to work together with our allies, especially those in the European Union, to find solutions to this energy challenge and move us closer to meeting our global climate goals while remaining mindful of the risk posed to these supply chains by unreliable foreign partners. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Woodring, and I work for SAFE Center for Critical Mineral Strategy. Those were two very interesting videos showing the European and the United States side of this vital energy transition we're going through. SAFE is a nonpartisan nonprofit based out of DC and the Critical Minerals Strategy Center. We work to diversify uh, critical minerals and battery component supply chains to help enhance our national security and economic competitiveness because we at the Minerals Center see diverse supply chains as being more resilient, predictable, and reliable than overly concentrated supply chains of minerals. Uh, we combine our real world geological and policy expertise to push policies that promote partnering with our allies like the European Union by committing to sourcing minerals from regions with high environmental, social and governance standards to overall foster transparency and create a global race to the top for the United States in the EV market. We have a great set of panelists for you to hear from today. I'm going to introduce them very briefly. We start with Peter Handley. He is uh, an EU official currently heading the team on energy intensive industries, raw materials and hydrogen at the European Commission's Directorate General for Internal Market Industry Entrepreneurship and SMEs. Previously, Peter was head of policy coordination for the Energy Union's 2030 Climate Energy Package, Low Emission Mobility Strategy and the Circular Economy at the Secretariat General. Prior to that, Peter was an EU trade negotiator and former UK government official. Our other panelist is Steve Feldkiss. He is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management at the Department of the Interior. Steve oversees a number of agencies at his job, including the Bureau of Land Management and the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. Prior to joining DOI in the Biden administration, he was Deputy Staff Director for the House Natural Resources Committee, specializing in mining and energy unit issues. Prior to that, Steve worked for various interior agencies and congressional offices for over 16 years. My third speaker today is Vincent Lado Padaye. He is the Chief Commercial Officer at Vulcan Energy. He has over 10 years of commercial experience in the chemicals and mining industry and was previously Executive Director of Corporate Strategy at Infinity Lithium Corporation, where Vincent led the project to become the first to secure EU funding. Vincent was also appointed as a lithium expert by the European Commission and worked at IHS Market, where he led the lithium and battery materials research team, covering the entire industry supply chain from raw materials to e-mobility. My fourth speaker is Michael Holloman. He's from United States Strategic Metals, a mining, processing, and recycling company based near St. Louis, Missouri. Michael is a 26-year commodity trading and mining veteran. He's a former Glencore trader and board member of multiple mines all around the world while he works with the international trading company Gunvor. Michael is currently commercial director at U.S. Strategic Metals, formerly known as Missouri Cobalt. Uh, welcome everyone and now we're going to start our discussion. 
panelists, just a reminder, feel free to jump in at any point while we're talking. My questions are mainly here to guide the conversation. I'm going to start off with a question to the government officials, but I'm going to mainly going to point it at Steve Felgus. Hard rock mining on public lands in the United States is largely governed by the general uh, mining law of 1872, which we know just reached its anniversary out of 150 year old law. What sort of challenges, if any, do you see, um, do you think that this presents to expanding the U.S. critical mineral supply chain, Steve? Thanks very much, Danielle, and, and thanks to Transport and Environment and um, SAFE for inviting me to be on this panel. So uh, that's a great question because uh, the Mining Law of 1872 is, um, uh, you know, certainly uh, it's a longstanding issue in the U.S. and there have been a lot of efforts to reform that over the past uh, really like 80 years or so. There have been uh, repeated efforts to change that. And there's a few real practical problems, we think, with the mining law. Um, first, just to give people background, if they're not familiar with how our mining law works, it is still self-initiation. Um, all lands, unless specifically withdrawn, all public lands in the U.S. are open for prospectors to go in, state claims, and then if they make a discovery, they have a right to, you know, actually develop that mineral. And previously, they were able to purchase that land for just a couple dollars an acre. But in 1994, Congress started shutting that feature off. So that's no longer an issue. Um, a few problems with this is, first of all, there's no royalties charged on uh, critical minerals. So that, you know, you can, you can debate royalty policy. But on a very practical level, what that means is we at the Interior Department who oversee our public lands can't tell you how many minerals are actually coming off U.S. public lands. Uh, we're asked very often how much lithium is being produced or how much cobalt or nickel or, or so on, or even just gold or copper, and we can't tell you. We don't have that information. Also, companies don't have to tell us what they're exploring for. So when companies go out, if they're um, doing some early-term exploration or they're doing um, you know, even just uh, some, some basic prospecting, we don't know whether they're looking for a critical mineral or for gold or copper or whatever their target is. So it's hard for us to really have a sense of what's in the pipeline and then strategically determine where we need to move our resources in order to handle permitting issues and figure out where the, you know, the choke points are going to be. But the other issue comes down to the fact that um, the mining law, while it's something that's very supported by the mining industry and it provides certain um, you know, simplicities uh, compared to other, say, leasing provisions that we have in the U.S. for other resources like oil, gas, and coal, um, Folks on the ground, communities, tribes, uh, stakeholders, often do not find out about mining pro um, projects until very late in the process. So companies can actually go out, drill well holes um, with having just filed a very simple notice to uh, the Bureau of Land Management. No one in the community might know that they're going out there. They'll only find out if they actually see the operation. So what you end up with is a very long period where the companies are out there doing exploration and not informing people of what they're doing. So you, once they submit their um, their permitting, you know, their mine plan of operations, it already feels very baked in and there's already been a lot of distrust built up within the community, within tribes. And then that leads to a lot of the, you know, the, the opposition to a lot of these projects, a lot of the lawsuits that we see. So while it's in some ways very beneficial for the industry to have something like the mining law of 1872 with all the freedoms that it provides, it also hurts them because just the way our system works, you know, it builds the sort of mistrust and skepticism of a lot of, a lot of people on the outside, and uh, that can end up slowing down a lot of projects. Wonderful. Thank you for walking me through that, Steve. It's, it sounds like we really need, to, even though we do have the high standards in the U.S. as we do mining, we also need to focus on maybe reforming some of these older laws and the permitting system. Um, I don't know if, if uh, maybe, Peter, you want to build on that, but my next question is to you moving towards the European Union side of things, which is also similar, but what do you feel is the number one challenge facing the critical mineral supply chain in Europe, and how is Europe going to plan to address those challenges? Well, first of all, I agree with um, everything that's been said by uh, uh, Hildegard Bentler and, and a lot of what's been said by uh, Senator Manchin. I think... Uh, the, the key challenge that we face here in the European Union is to reduce our level of strategic dependency um, on others for the things which matter most for the plans we have for the future. And to be more concrete, it doesn't make sense for us to be 95 to 100 percent dependent on a single country, whatever that country may be, for something that's vital for our future. Um, so that's the number one challenge. And that means we have to do everything across the full spectrum of activities described by Hildegard Bentler 
domestically and uh, externally to, to find solutions, which will not be a si single silver bullet. We have to do a variety of things. And the link to that is to do whatever we have to do to reduce our strategic dependencies and balancing that with sustainability and, and maximizing circular economy. And in a certain way, trying to suppress demand. We have to find ways that we don't need as much materials as uh, we think we do if we, if we think about more innovative ways of doing things. That's a really good point, Peter. Um, innovation is key. And I know that Europe and, and the America, we're, we're very good at innovating here. We're very good at R&D in this space. Um, I guess then I'll move to the, my private sector um, panelists, Vincent, you know, building on what Peter and Steve just said about, you know, environmental ethos and, and working well with communities. Can you tell us a little bit about Vulcan's environment etho environmental ethos? And do you think what Europe plans, uh, as outlined by Peter and Hildegard, is sufficient? And then uh, what is needed in your view to boost, boost local and sustainable supply? Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, look, the goal of the company was always to be um, helping automakers and battery makers to decarbonize the supply chain. Because when you look at the current situation of the lithium industry, um, as Peter mentioned, you know, majority of, of, of lithium and critical uh, metals requirements are actually coming from uh, foreign countries, including China. Uh, today, we see that around 95% of Europe's needs for lithium will be coming from China. So it's a geopolitical issue, but it's also an environmental issue because for every ton of lithium produced in China, you'll emit around 15 tons of CO2. So we decided to look at what technology and what resource can we use in Europe to actually produce uh, zero carbon lithium. So we selected um, a direct lithium extraction technology and we started looking for a geothermal source of energy, a geothermal brine because it was going to offer us a renewable source of energy to actually power the lithium extraction process. So we created the company back in 2018 now. Um, we are now much more advanced, close to 200 employees working on this project to extract a zero carbon lithium uh, from the Up Rhine Valley in Germany. And we're not just planning on producing lithium, we're also planning on producing an, an renewable energy which is used for all process, but also distributed in the form of heat and electricity to local communities. Um, we have been securing a number of long-term supply agreements with key automakers and battery makers like Volkswagen, Stellantis, Renault, LG and Yumiko, and also secured more than 400 uh, million euros uh, from the private sector to uh, make this project a reality. There's still a lot of work to be done, but we've been working very hard on de-risking the technology that we're using, which is zero carbon, um, and also potentially looking at where else we can expand our project to help other countries and the rest of Europe to actually de-risk their access to a zero carbon lithium. So I think Europe has the potential in terms of resource to be more independent in terms of lithium extraction, but also to apply um, new technology to actually make this uh, a reality in direct lithium extraction and the type of direct lithium extraction technology we're using is uh, is a proof of that. Wow, that's that's wonderful to hear. I uh, and that actually segues very well into my question for Michael, which is, you know, U.S. Uh, strategic Metals is now successfully operating an old abandoned lead mine in the middle of the U.S., uh, Michael, and it's producing nickel and cobalt for EV batteries. So how is USSM's business model a bit different than the usual mining practices, um, like similar to the different um, techniques that Vincent's using at Vulcan? Um, and then how can other U.S. mining companies replicate these practices? Yes, thank you for that question, Danielle. And, and I, I love to see what Vincent is doing with, with zero carbon lithium and what everyone is talking about here. I, I've been in this industry for many, many years, uh, a lot of that time in Russia, Africa, Indonesia. And I, I've just watched how the mining industry worked over this time. And there was not zero, but there was very little focus on these issues, these very important climate issues, carbon issues, emission issues. And I, I was actually out of the business when I got a call four years ago to go and look at a Superfund site in Missouri that was an old lead mine. It was run by National Lead. It had been mined since before the 1872 law 
um, Steve. It was actually run by the French before the Louisiana Purchase. It's the, the large Galena belt near the Mark Twain National Forest. Not many people know about this big geology that America has for lead, but along with the lead, you know, lo and behold, cobalt, copper, nickel. There's also some zinc and silver mixed in as well. But we approach this from a completely different viewpoint. I mean, most mining people do not take the environmental side as, as a, uh, a focus of their, of their business plan. We got into this business because our sister company, Environmental Operations Incorporated, is one of the largest environmental cleanup companies in the U.S. It's working on the Brewer Gold Mine and a bunch of other projects in, in the United States, old mines which need to be cleaned up environmentally properly. And the, the way to do it is the way we've done it with EOI. We went hand in hand with the EPA. We asked them, how do we need to clean this up? Only after we had it clean did we buy the mine. Then we asked them, what do we need to do to mine it? And they, they issued, issued us a, an administrative order of consent. And now top of mind for us is environment. We've taken this kind of you know, dystopian wasteland and turned it into a beautiful 1,800 acres where the only place you see above ground that there's activity, that's the only place that's disturbed. Everywhere we cap tailings, we plant trees, we plant grass, we plant bushes. Our goal is to become a carbon sink, you know, on our 1800 acres. And, you know, working together with the EPA, with, with people from, you know, the Department of Interior, that, that is how we are approaching our, our mine. And, you know, the fact that it is cobalt, nickel, copper, and the fact that we've started building processing in America, which is highly important, we have to close the loop, is, um, is really, I, I think, an effective strategy. And that's why we also, when we started our processing research, we went for zero emission, low carbon, hydrometallurgical processing, not dirty smelters like our, our rivals who are extremely smart in the East, you know, have built miles of, of this kind of processing, we need to work together with the Europeans because the, the Chinese don't have cobalt and nickel. You know, they, they just built the processing and now everything's swinging their way. I just think we need to work together, Europe, the US, to, to swing the world's raw materials to processing in countries that really take an interest in keeping it clean. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Mike. Um, and, and it's interesting to hear about your approach in the U.S. and then Vincent's approach. Um, and so I'm wondering, Steve, um, do you have anything that you'd like to build on after hearing this, maybe in regards to your work with the Department of Interior at the International, sorry, Intergovernmental Working Group on Mining, Hard Rock Mining Issues, and how maybe companies like Mike that came in to clean areas first could, could be prioritized or helped? Yeah, sure thing. Um, well, I mean, Mike's uh, projects is an excellent example of something that we are really trying to focus on and uh, support in the administration, which is going in and helping to either uh, remine sites where there might be critical minerals remaining in tailings piles or other sort of mine waste, or just finding non-traditional sources of critical minerals. Um, there's a lot of research money going into acid mine drainage and looking at, um, you know, potentially how to pull some critical minerals out of those streams. Um, one of the issues that we have, though, in the U.S., and Mike mentioned in the administrative order consent that they got with EPA, uh, mm -hmm. there are certain liability issues that arise for companies that want to go into areas that have been previously mined, especially if they're a Superfund site or their potential water contamination issues, which is you know, probably most of our, our former mining sites uh, throughout the West. So um, because of those liability issues, a lot of people in the U.S. are looking for what are called Good Samaritan protections. That is, if you're not responsible for the original uh, pollution, you are, you are given a liability waiver so you can go in and try to clean those sites up and you know, potentially remind them or simply you know, address uh, acid mine drainage or other issues on the surface. There are a lot of um, environmental NGOs, a lot of sportsmen groups that are very interested in doing this work because there are a lot of, say, trout fishing streams that are um, contaminated 
with legacy mine waste. And they would like to go in and clean some of these up, but the liability issues stop them. So the administration is supportive of Good Samaritan protections. Back in February, we rolled out uh, the Biden-Harris administration's fundamental principles for mining law reform, sort of laid out what we would like to see in sort of the future of mining in the U.S. And one of those issues was better protection for Good Samaritans. Now, of course, we uh, can't do that ourselves. That's something that Congress needs to work on. And there are some bills, you know, that are being debated. Uh, there are a lot of nuances to how you set these up. What kind of protections do you need to make sure that people don't take um, advantage of some of these systems? But we do believe that there is a way to structure something that's um, you know, that's, that's helpful, that's win-win, that's good for uh, the environment, that's good for these communities that are impacted by the, the pollution, and good for the companies or, or groups that are cleaning these up. And uh, that's sort of just one of the things that we're looking at as part of this interagency working group that you mentioned that we also announced in February, and we are looking at that issue, but then the whole suite of things, legally, regulatory side, policy issues around mining in the U.S., and, and how can we improve the process. That's wonderful to hear. So I wonder, Peter, you know, building upon what uh, Steve's doing with the Department of the Interior with the Working Group on Mining, um, we know about EU's Critical Raw Materials Act, which is, uh, you know, as Sildegard Bentel mentioned earlier, creating a list of strategic projects that can benefit from streamlined permitting and um, everything like that. And so I was wondering if you could speak a bit as to what the Critical Raw Materials Act is, what it wants to, uh, what the goals of it are, and, and what you're working on and how we could maybe work together. Um, happy to, but I'd, I'd just like to react to uh, what we've heard so far. Um, uh, <laughs> what we've heard from Vincent is exactly the kind of thing that we are going to try and do more of, innovative uh, ways to work, um, and also making sure that projects get the very early buy-in from the downstream manufacturers. We need to have the offtake model to make sure that people are not offering to create a project for which there's no market. That's, that's, that's one comment. And the second thing is... Um, we have underestimated the potential that we have from old mining operations and the mining waste sitting on the surface. Things which were considered waste, and as Hildegard Bentler said, they're not waste, they're, 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 they're key materials that we can make use of, and they're in a more concentrated form than digging up tons of rock from underneath the ground. So we see a lot of potential for recovering a range of critical raw materials from this kind of uh, waste. We have a very active project in Sweden at the moment, uh, LKAB is recovering rare earths and phosphates from iron ore waste. And uh, there's a Canadian company active in the Czech Republic, which is recovering battery grade manganese from um, an environmentally, you know, badly uh, remediated site. So it's a win-win if we can get the materials and improve the environment and also be operating in regions such as coal regions, which have a a need to transition to industries of the future and have a knowledge and expertise in engineering and these kind of skills. Now, as far as our um, plans are concerned, we want to identify strategic resources. We want to identify the geological resources which can be tapped in the next uh, 50, 100 years. So we want member states in the European Union to look deeper than they've looked before and to look broader and think about future needs, not just today's needs. And we want to identify strategic projects across the value chain, starting from exploration, through mining, through refining, uh, uh, recycling, and also better understanding of the, the mining waste sites that can form part of our circularity approach. And we would like to have consequences flow from this. This, this process of de defining strategic projects is something we do successfully in the energy field already. And we'd like to have uh, priority access to funding for these strategic projects, and we'd like to have uh, streamlined, effective, fit-for-purpose permitting, which is very important to say, does not weaken the environmental and social protections. It's about inefficient processes, uh, removing predictability for investors. Absolutely, those are... It sounds like you have a very good plan in Europe. I'm wondering, uh, Vincent or Michael, if either of you have a response to that. I don't know, Vincent, we want to start with you. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Peter. I agree. I think uh, we need to develop um, a number of different types of uh, raw material extraction in Europe. And that can start with recycling tellings and, and mining waste from the past. But we also need to support the development of greenfields mining operation 
We also need to develop the type of project we are developing in Germany, which is really not mining, but more geothermal energy and chemicals at the same time. And we also need to look into uh, financing conversion projects, uh, which will have for a number of years to import from outside of Europe. But it's a necessity looking when we look at the demand, which is in Europe. And lastly, we also need to look at recycling uh, of, of, those, uh, of those batteries that we are going to produce in Europe. But the priority for me is to start focusing on extracting our own resource within Europe in uh, obviously doing it in an environmental way. Um, Europe has started looking at de-risking the lithium-ion battery supply chain back in 2017 already, when they created the European Battery um, Alliance. Um, since then, a lot of capital has actually been invested in supporting the uh, construction of electric vehicles, batteries, and also cathodes. Uh, was recently on the site of Umico in Belgium, that was supported by the EIB, and it's great to see that there's still a massive gap uh, between what is being invested in batteries and EVs compared to what is being invested in the upstream, which is the extraction and conversion of uh, critical raw materials such as lithium. So I think there's still a bit of work to do and we've started already a number of years ago and we can't just ask only the private sector to finance those different projects. The private sector also needs to see that the EU is stepping in by providing capital uh, to, uh, to support this project. And I'm hoping that within the next couple of years, we will start seeing sufficient capital being invested by the European Commission through the EIB or other mechanisms to actually support those projects to become a, a reality. Wonderful. Um, I don't know, Mike, do you have anything to build on that, especially Vincent's re responses to using greenfield sites and recycling? I know that you are uh, processing materials from used batteries, black mass, correct? Yes, I, I would just say that that's exactly right what Vincent said about the misallocation of capital. There, there's a lot of money being spent on gigafactories. Um, we, we have uh, many gigafactories going up in the United States. We know the two largest OEMs, Ford and GM, have spent $50 billion on their, their kind of downstream uh, processes. And you, you wonder where they're getting the raw materials from. Where is the money that's going to come in to help with the raw materials? They have contracts with people like LG and SK and Glencore, et cetera. And you, you wonder, listen, you, you may have that contract. Though, are you sure you're going to get those, those raw materials? Have you looked at the supply chain? Where's the PCAM coming from? Where's the CAM coming from? I mean, one of the things about our project that you know, started out as just building a concentrator, we were going to send concentrate to Canada, to the smelters. We realized that wasn't a good business model. So we've gone all in on hydrometallurgy. We're building a zero emission, low carbon hydromet plant that has, has gotten us to the point where we're going to be making battery grade sulfate by the middle of next year. So we'll be the only ones in North America providing this kind of solution. We could go much bigger if we had more funding, but the U.S. government, especially this administration, is focused on it. You look at the BIL, you look at the IRA, they have these are historic laws that are going to help the green transition. And although we missed on the first, um, the first allocation of, of money from the BIL, we are still going to be in there chasing funding. We need it. These are huge CapEx intensive projects. But, you know, the beauty is, I, I got sidetracked for a moment, the beauty of, of our, you know, tailings and our ore that we're thinking about going back in and, and, and uh, uh, extracting we have a ne nearby company that is, is the black mass leader in America. It's a company called Interco that has been doing commercial lithium ion battery recycling for 13 years. For, for at least seven, they've been making black mass. And we now have a warehouse full of black mass that will be the beginning feed for our processing in the US. So we're now a recycler. They're actually building a calcining and shredding operation right next to us in Little Fredericktown, Missouri, which is about to become a hub of North American battery and green energy. But what's interesting is the recycling movement is, is, a, is going to be a hit or miss movement. That There will be losers. There are people building recycling, large recycling plants around the world right now, and there's no end of life feed for big lithium ion batteries. It's only production scrap. It's only bolt recall. And it's, it's uh, you know, cars that are in wrecks. There, 
end of life is five, six years away until we get a lot of end of life batteries, lithium ion. So it is a, it is a dicey thing, but I, I love the fact that everybody is out there planning to get in on the recycling. Um, you know, the recycling wave, our, our processing is already recovering 85 plus percent of the metal from the lithium ion batteries, including the lithium. So we'll be a lithium producer as, as a, a mine in the middle of Missouri. But um, yeah, I was just, uh, I, I love to hear it, how, how invested people are, that the EU is taking it seriously. And, and the U.S. government is absolutely taking it seriously. And that is such a breath of fresh air. Does anyone want to comment on what uh, Mike just said? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I'm doing the old fashioned analog hand in the air. I'm not quite I can sure see about you. <laughs> um, Look, uh, very, very, very pleased to hear what Mike's just said there, because um, uh, we're building this uh, circularity very much into the core of our battery strategy, right? If you've seen our battery regulation proposal, it's about designing the batteries in, in a good way. It's about having battery uh, passports so you can track and trace the pieces as they go through their life. You know exactly what you're dealing with in 10 years time when you take something apart. It's about setting ambitious recycling targets. And it's also about setting ambitious minimum recycled content for the future. So it's really uh, a design of a policy over time. And I agree with what we just heard. At the moment, there isn't the volume around of the end of life vehicles, um, but there is a lot of there is a lot of process material and a lot of uh, second uh, second quality stuff coming from vehicles. We have to start with what we've got. I think the the thing we both both uh, sides of the Atlantic need to avoid is that we again treat this stuff black mass as a waste uh, and let it be shipped across to Asia, which is just all too keen to be processing this stuff. We have to keep this business in our jurisdictions. Um, and if I may, having heard Mike refer to the, 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 the brilliance of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and similar, I'd like to say a word on that, which is that, yes, it's a very strong and effective piece of legislation in America. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's creating a bit of tension between the United States and Europe. I'm not gonna enter into the details, but there's a task force been set up to try and find a way where we're not competing against each other for the same kind of investments in the green transition because we are allies. We're, we're, we're working together bilaterally in the Trade and Technology Council. We're working together plurilaterally in the G7, in the new Mineral Security Partnership and in the new International Energy Agency Working Party on critical minerals. We can't afford to be setting our businesses against each other or our administrations against each other. There's too much at stake here where we have common interests. I, I agree with you, Peter, and and um, the the IRA was at least helpful for, in the sense that it'll you know force that transparency into the supply chain so that you know these automotive companies are aware of where their materials are coming from uh, just because of the the 30D section on tax credits. Um, but I agree, we need to learn how to work together and work together because we have so many valuable resources and we are both allies. Um, I was wondering if, you know, I don't know, Steve, do you have anything to say in regards to um, how we can build a sustainable domestic supply chain here in the U.S. to based on uh, like how we make sure that mining communities are also not harmed and deal with kind of those negative legacies of the past too? Yeah, sure thing. And, and first, I'll you know echo what Mike said about the administration being very focused on the domestic production of critical minerals. It's something that a uh, number of departments across the government, really the whole of government, is working on right now. There are a number of uh, interagency teams. The one that I'm working on, looking at uh, laws, regulations, and permitting, is just one of them. There are others looking at uh, you know, focusing on batteries. The American Battery Mineral Initiative was just announced by the uh, administration couple weeks ago. So that is an, another way to really bring some more focus into how do we get these minerals in the U.S. and how do we get them sustainably? And that's an important point that's been brought up a couple of times. I know Peter mentioned that we want to improve the permitting process, but we don't want to do that at the cost of environmental protections or social responsibility. And that's a, you know, a really key point that leads into the question you just asked, which is how do we, how do we make sure that community voices and tribal voices, which have been largely... Um, ignored in many cases over the past, you know, in the history of this country, um, you know, are heard and that they actually have a voice in how these 
you know, decisions are being made. And we think that a lot of it has to do with early engagement. And most mining companies, I believe, especially the larger mining companies, agree. And a lot of the comments that we've gotten to our interagency working group stress that early engagement is essential. Unfortunately, our system doesn't work, uh, doesn't make that mandatory, first of all, and really doesn't incentivize it. So you have a lot of companies that don't do that. And what we're trying to figure out is how do we ensure that you know, things don't wait until the plan of operations is submitted before a community or a tribe has a chance to weigh in and let companies know, you know, these are our sacred areas or these are important areas we need protected or this is a crucial water source. But start that planning earlier when companies still have a chance to build that in on the, the front end. And then also ensure that, you know, there is a lot of tremendous potential if done right for communities and tribes to do very well with mining project in their communities. There's a lot of economic development potential, a lot of jobs, a lot of new infrastructure that could be created that for many of these communities, they would love to see, but they're not getting a chance. They're not coming in, uh, they're not getting an opportunity early enough to say, these are the kind of investments we would like to see. Here's how we would actually like to partner with the industry. Um, so that is one of our main focuses, figuring out how do we do that? How do we incentivize companies to go in earlier, work with those companies, uh, work with those communities, with the tribes, and figure out how do we come up with something that both allows the mine to be developed, but not at the expense of the community or the tribe that lives nearby. That's a wonderful point. I don't know if um, maybe Vincent, you want to speak to what Vulcan does in regards to community community engagement and and from the EU side of things for permitting. Absolutely. So I've worked on a on a number of, of projects in Europe, and um, I have to say we we've all can we we're lucky because I believe that you can't just start developing a mining project or an extraction project and just think that you're just going to extract the mineral you're after, and that's it. You need to be there to offer something to the local communities and to make them part of this project. Um, I'm saying we're lucky enough because in our case we're not just extracting lithium, we're also extracting renewable energy. And there's obviously a, an energy, energy crisis going on in, in Europe and globally at the moment, but Germany is especially um, exposed to this. Uh, a majority of their uh, energy generation is actually um, heat, and most of that heat is being produced by um, using natural gas, which is mostly imported and mostly imported from Russia. So what we're offering with renewable energy extracted from GFM wells is that we're offering local municipalities to basically do risk the energy supply by supplying them with renewable heat directly from where they are located. So our goal is not just to extract brine to produce lithium, but it's also to extract brine to supply local communities with renewable heat and renewable electricity. We've actually uh, already um, concluded a contract with the city of Meinheim in Germany and their utility provider, which is called Enfafa, uh, to supply them for um, at least 10 years with renewable heat. Uh, so that's one of the examples of the initiatives we have to uh, be accepted by local communities and be able to develop our project uh, uh, faster and in a better way as well. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, Peter, I was going to point to you anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I'm amazed that America's got an 1872 mining law still in force. Um, our, what we have as a negative is that we've got a patchwork because we have 27 member states, each of which has its own mining uh, legislation. Um, so it's a bit difficult for operators to, to know how to, to operate in, in every part of Europe, right? It's quite complex. Um, plus the responsibilities are often sub-national level that regions are responsible for mining uh, and mining permitting and things like that. But that said, we do have um, rules in place which make it uh, essential to, to talk to local communities and to other stakeholders. There's no way projects can just be snuck through with nobody being, being aware of what's going on. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities for legal redress as well. We have in the last year developed what we call the the principles uh, for sustainable raw materials in Europe, set of eight principles, which are very strongly inspired by the best regimes around the world that we've seen. The work of the OECD has also influenced us. And these principles include things like, you know, a, a responsible company engages at an early opportunity with all the local and um, community stakeholders. And, you know, should be discussing things like uh, uh, the economic benefit, benefit sharing from, from projects and job creation and so on and so forth. Um, 
And, and these principles, they don't just stand floating in the air. They're basically translated into action through the various bits of the European uh, regulatory framework that, that underpin each of these principles. So we think it's important to, uh, as we move to develop our Critical Raw Materials Act, to make it very clear that we're providing a reassuring framework within which we can safely uh, do more domestically from uh, exploration through greenfield mining uh, right down the rest of the value chain. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for that summary, Peter. I look forward to reading the final act. I'm going to move on to Julia. We have some questions from the audience and she is going to pose them to our panelists. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, we had some um, a really great discussion uh, so far, some really good, uh, good points made. Uh, there have been quite a few questions. So uh, given the time, I'll try to um, put them into a few areas. Something asked by a few, uh, notably, for example, by Anik, Anik Bernhardt, is a question around hydrogen. So the conversation so far focused understandably a lot on battery metals and EVs. Uh, what about green hydrogen and how does that affect the material needs and supply in your view? Uh, so maybe looking at the speakers to see who would like to take this uh, first. Um, I'm happy to have a first go since hydrogen is part of my, my, my remit. Um, we've we've, we've analysed this. Um, because uh, we have a hydrogen strategy uh, and we actually increased the level of ambition of our hydrogen strategy earlier this year in the repower EU um, uh, policy. Um, and what we see is that there are certain key dependencies for our ability to develop and uh, deploy uh, renewable hydrogen. The fuel cells and the electrolyzers, at least the best technologies that exist today, they require a range of critical raw materials, notably platinum group metals, which brings us again back to strategic dependencies. Uh, the biggest suppliers of those platinum group metals are South Africa and uh, our friends in Russia, right? Um, so there are issues there about securing the supply of these materials and also looking at innovation to give us alternative technologies that uh, can re reduce our need to, to rely so much on these few materials. Um, and we have, through the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance, which my team manages, uh, developed a work stream to explore uh, how we can address these, these concerns, both in terms of security of supply and uh, innovation. Peter, thanks for highlighting that it's really about an area of technologies, not just batteries that have a supply challenge. Steve, maybe something from the US perspective and the, the, the analysis of this that you have done. Well, sure. Unfortunately, um, the Department of the Interior does not have a large uh, presence in hydrogen. Um, that's not uh, not really something that we're, we're working on too much. So I don't have too much to add from the U.S. other than I know that, uh, you know, the Department of Energy is doing a lot on hydrogen, a lot of research. There's quite a bit of money that was provided in the, in the recent laws that were passed that were referenced earlier. So there is a lot of interest and excitement about the potential for hydrogen. These hydrogen hubs, I believe, that are going to be set up. Um, in different parts of the U.S. Um, unfortunately, that's not something that I can speak much to from our own perspective because um, we're, you know, we're, we're sort of more about the things that can come directly out of the ground. So we focus a lot on helium, but uh, I don't think that's as quite as that's another much another topic right here. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so a quick question to you, uh, Vansan, which is really about Vulcan. Um, what is the status concerning the production of lithium? Has it started already and, and when will it start? A question from Pierre, Pierre Serkin. Thank you very much. I was actually just going to add something on hydrogen. Um, it's actually something we produce. Um, it's a byproduct of the electrolysis system we're having. It's actually a, a green hydrogen because we're using renewable en energy coming from our geothermal assets. So it's not a big quantity, um, but uh, it's it's a good thing too. And we also saw a lot of people just putting hydrogen and lithium into some sort of competition, which is not the case. Actually, hydrogen can help uh, the lithium industry to be greener. I know that a number of converters in Europe are currently looking at how they can replace natural gas with green hydrogen for the kilns that will be, they will be using to convert um, materials like spodumene into lithium chemicals. So I think the industry, both industry, can support um, each other to make the European markets uh, greener. So on the, um, on the Vulcan side, we started the project in 2018. Um, we are, since the beginning of the year, officially a producer of renewable energy. We actually acquired an existing geothermal plant 
which has been running for 10 years, but uh, which is now owned by, by Volcan. So we're selling renewable electricity. Um, and on the lithium side, we've been operating a pilot plant for the last 19 months now. Um, our goal is to go into production in 2025. So we've got a few, um, a few years to go, uh, mostly uh, busy with actually raising capital to finance this project and also finalizing the construction of two much larger demonstration plants. Um, which will be producing several tons per month of uh, lithium hydroxide, which are then sent to our off-takers for pre-testing uh, before we can actually start selling commercial volume of lithium to, to the market. So uh, a few years ago, but we're not too far away from commercial start now. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for giving this detail. So one more question for all of you, and, and I'll start with Mike to give you a first chance to, to answer. There's a question from Rachel, Rachel Zimba, who asks... Could you comment on the role that other like-minded countries like Canada might play uh, in any of the developments discussed here today? So, Mike, I'll let you start first on Canada and other like-minded countries. Well, I, I think we have a very healthy competition with Canada right now. You, you have some very big international companies that are there. You, you have, uh, you know, Sherit and Glencore and Vale, all mining critical metals, um, also processing. You have companies um, that are putting together, together with the government, they're putting together um, uh, battery parks. Uh, they want to also do PCAM, which I forgot to mention. We just broke ground in September on our PCAM pilot. We've been running our Hydromet pilot for two years. Uh, commercial, commercial plant will be in production uh, beginning of middle of next year. And the, the PCAM we're working on really hard. We want to we crack that one. But look, Canada just came out with maybe the most aggressive, you know, kind of law to make sure things happen. I think it was last week where they are now not allowing Chinese investment in critical metals companies and they're disinvesting current Chinese investors. So I think Canada is, is even maybe taking it a step further. It's something that I, I really like that they've done this. It's kind of a first shot across the bow to try to, to um, you know, realign the global, uh, you know, it, it's a stranglehold right now. As Vincent said, 95% of all the battery raw materials that go into your battery are processed in China. This is a, this is something that we need to look at doing. I'm very proud of our, our friends to the north for what they've, they've just done with that recent move. I, I'd like to see us do maybe something like that. And, um, I think we need to be we need to be discussing everything with them. Every option's on the table. We can process their metal in Missouri. It will it will cut down that supply chain, that fifty thousand mile current average supply chain twice around the world. The average battery goes, um, and so if we help them, they help us. We can we can take their battery scrap. We can send our batteries back to them. I think there's a lot to be said for. Um, making, you know, bringing Canada, also Australia, you know, there's a, quite a few South Korea, Japan, big companies that align with America and, and the European Union that, that can join in to help. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, so looking at, at others, maybe um, Steve, Peter, Van Song, anything to add on, on other like-minded countries? Sure, I'll let uh, Peter do the reason to yeah, I just want to comment on Canada because Canada is very interesting. Uh, we have a strategic partnership with Canada and it's already producing real investments in both directions. We have uh, Canadian investment in many projects in Europe, but um, we're working very closely, particularly around the rare earths value chain and the battery value chain. Uh, BASF recently announced it's going to build a, a facility. I think it's in Quebec or Ontario. I always get mixed up. But um, what we see Canada doing, it's trying to use its uh, resource richness to move along the value chain. It wants to become uh, not you know, the supplier of the, the low value or it wants to be a real uh, player in both the North American and uh, European markets. And I think that's a good pivot role for it to, to develop. Um, of course, it also benefits by being considered as uh, North American under the FTA, which again comes back to the the discriminatory aspects that we have uh, identified in the Inflation Reduction Act. But I'm not going to bang on about that nonstop. I think it's very important that we see United States and Canada and Japan and Australia and South Korea and even the British as, as potential partners in addressing the 
the need for a like-minded uh, jurisdictions approach to address common, common problems in the security of supply for these minerals. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Any, any more remarks before I move to, to the last question to you all? Yeah, sure. I was just going to erase what Peter said about the, the free trade agreement that we have with Canada. So materials from Canada fall under the domestic sourcing requirements of the Inflation Reduction Act. So um, even you know, beyond that component, there's a very strong partnership that we have with Canada. Um, we had a chance to go up and visit some uh, Canadian sites recently and uh, take a look at some of their processing uh, work up there. But another thing that we're really paying very much, uh, very close attention to in Canada is the way that they engage with their First Nations, because they have, um, you know, some, some different uh, policies and laws up there regarding engagement. Uh, they have a law in British Columbia, for example, that's um, supposed to, you know, enact a sort of free prior and informed consent structure in the province for mining projects. And we're watching that very closely to see how that works. But just in general, the way that they engage from the beginning and the way that there are different um, First Nation communities and, and organizations in Canada that are working to try to partner with a lot of the, the mining projects up there. And again, make it less of a contentious issue and more of a partnership where both the industry and the, the tribal nations can, you know, get something out of these projects. So that's something that we're paying a lot of attention uh, to through our working group. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so the final question I have to you all, and as we come to then, maybe if you can all be, be brief and say, take less than, than a minute is, so we talked about so many, so important, such important things here. I mean, we can all sit all day and talk about critical metals. It's really the topic today. But one of the specific angles of this webinar is cooperation. Cooperation, not competition, as has been said, between, uh, between the United States and, and, and Europe. So maybe from all of your different perspectives and priorities, what would be this one or two things that you see as the most useful, the core potential to, to within this cooperation? Operation to do in the next years. I suggest we start maybe from the back of the speaker. So Vincent, Vincent, would you like to go first? Sorry, thank you, Julia. Um, we actually have a very close um, relationship with, with the US and North America in general. Since we started our project, there's actually a lot of knowledge, a lot of expertise located in North America and specifically um, in the US for us, it's mostly sitting in California and in the Southern Sea uh, because we have a lot of geothermal, uh, uh, brown geothermal energy, and they've been working for a while on developing direct lithium extraction technology as well. Uh, so actually quite a few of our employees working on the lithium side um, are coming from, uh, from California and have experience in developing similar processes in California. So a very close relationship with the US on the technical side, also with engineering companies who have expertise in building power plant demonstration plants for direct lithium extraction technology, but also companies like Dupont, who is supplying you know, commercial solution for some of the components that we are going to use for, for direct lithium extraction. So for us, from a technology perspective, it's very important to exchange knowledge between, between both regions to help us to move forward uh, faster and, and in, a, in a more, more efficient way as well. Thank you. Thanks, Wansang. Mike, a few words from you. Yeah, I think that's a good point, sharing our knowledge and um, sharing uh, expertise. We, we also have U European experts um, that are working on PCAM for us. We, we looked around the US, there, there weren't many experts. We have some Europeans working on our, our pilot plant. Now they were, they were based in the Congo running, running uh, plants down there, um, but they're European experts. Um, you know, I, I also think that it, it's good that, that we compete, but we, we have to talk to each other so we don't overlap. And this is the, the, the story about, you know, there will be losers. I, I know that there are people running at recycling, running at processing, um, less so running at mining, but lots of money is being spent on things that maybe shouldn't be spent, you know, and, and I think there, there's some realism that has to come, but I, I think the competition is healthy. It is good. And, you know, we need to co cooperate on information. I mean, our biggest partner at Missouri Cobalt is Glencore. It's a Swiss-based, you know, mining and trading company. It's, it's the largest, you know, uh, trader of metals in the world, especially in the critical metal space. And they, 
they are a great source of information and and uh, marketing. We're we're sold out to to Glencore, um, so it's it's a. I think it's something we've got to all share and talk about. But I, I wouldn't eliminate the the competition part of it because I think it makes us all work harder to get there. You know what I mean? Thanks, Mike. Healthy competition never harmed nobody, right? Thank you. Um, so, Steve. And then, and then Peter? Sure. Well, I'll just echo the, the themes of cooperation, knowledge sharing, and partnership that we've heard from other speakers. I think it's critically important to maintain these kind of dialogues. Webinars like this, I think, are very helpful where you have European and U.S. Uh, speakers sharing information, getting a chance to hear from one another directly. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, what I would love to see is just more events in the U.S. Uh, I feel like I could have spent the entire month in Europe. We had IGF in Geneva this week and a Raw Materials Week is next week in Brussels. And uh, I, I just can't get to Europe that often. I would love to. I don't have the travel budget or the, or the ability to get over there. Um, and I, I think on a more serious level, though, it's a little unfortunate that we don't have more things happening, at least on the East Coast of the U.S., uh, because I think that would be a good chance to get more U.S. policymakers, more folks from our agencies uh, able to go to these conferences um, and interact directly with the, their European counterparts. Because right now we have, uh, you know, limited ability to send that many people over to Europe for these uh, conferences as much as we would love to be there. So that, that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I've got three points. The first is on the knowledge sharing and the expertise. Uh, we're very happy to host our American friends next week to talk about precisely the best state of, uh, state of knowledge in, in the critical mineral space, um, and that needs to continue. The second is, let's not forget, we have lots of European companies operating in America, helping with your green transition, and lots of American companies doing the same in Europe. So, you know, it's in everyone's interest to keep this thing running nice and smooth, and yeah, fair competition, but let's keep it fair. Um, the third point is I see a new potential where America and Europe can work side by side in developing projects together in Africa and Latin America, keeping these projects in the West, if you like, uh, but not just looking for the raw materials, helping these countries to raise their game in terms of environmental, social and governance performance, helping them to become more circular and helping them to keep more value in the country. Thank you. For, thank you for this uh, great last words. Uh, so I will uh, now just spend a few minutes to summarize briefly what, what we have heard so far. Um, and I just would like to, first of all, thank you all our speakers and everyone who joined us today to spend this 75 minutes with us to learn, to listen, and, and, and hopefully get inspired for the various things and priorities that we all have in the area of critical metals. I would like to point out four, four points that stand out for me in this discussion. I think, first of all, we all agreed uh, on the need at the very beginning, and it's really then it's important as, as a label for this, on the need for diverse and resilient supply of critical uh, raw materials. As Peter said, that it doesn't matter which country, we shouldn't never be relying on just one supplier. And I think in all of this global cooperation, transparent open markets are, are key. The second point I think that, that we heard and learned so much today about is the fact that today there is technology that allows for much lower impact and sustainable practices in mining, recycling, etc., to really get materials with actually less and, and good environmental footprint. Van Sound told us about the Vulcan project and the direct lithium extraction, which is not just there to, to bring things like zero carbon lithium and as a European uh, supply of this, but also provide, for example, renewable heat to communities around. We heard a lot about circularity, and that was really very promising for us as t &E especially to hear such a focus on circularity and recycling. And there, again, Mike was telling us how in their company, they already recover 85% of the different critical metals, including lithium. Very important to remember for all of us here in Europe working on the battery regulation where we're not yet that to, to recover such high amounts of lithium. And of course, last but not least, we also talked a lot about remining and this new idea of actually not, uh, not seeing waste as garbage, as Ms. Bantler told us at the beginning. I think the third point, which is important to stress for all, all of us, is that today policymakers are taking things seriously. We've heard from Steve, 
we've heard from Peter, uh, those of us on the American side, I hope now are experts on the European Critical Raw Materials Act. And of course, those like me on, on the European side learned a lot about what the US side is planning. Of course, the US IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, has come up. There is no conversation today without it. Uh, but I think it's clear that we all have the same objective in mind. We talked a lot about permitting as well. And it's really important that all the policymakers look at this seriously. There's a lot more efficiency we can do. But what is really important is to do it with communities in mind. And there, I think some of the points that were raised, for example, by, by Vincent, by Steve, how important it is to get communities on board early and to offer them something, for them to be a stakeholder, to be part of this, is so crucial for this entire transition to actually go in the right direction and with people in mind. And I would like to finish on the final point, uh, on my fourth observation, and that's around cooperation. Uh, I, I really put here cooperation, not competition, uh, we are all allies, even though a bit of healthy competition is good for everyone. And, you know, as a, as a side joke, I can definitely tell you coming from a post-Soviet Union bloc that a bit of competition definitely is something we missed to have better industries back when I, when, where I come from. But competition, sorry, but cooperation between the two, the two regions can help us develop projects abroad, competition and a cooperation. You see, I, I'm on competition now, cooperation on technology development, on efficiency, on knowledge sharing. And I would just like to, to finish by saying, um, of course, many companies and many of us really would like to see a lot more capital, a lot more money into this critical value chain. But what we've also heard is actually it seems like we all need a bit more money to travel more and see each other to actually improve that cooperation between policymakers. So let's talk more. Uh, let's work together and let's really make this transition work for everyone, the planet, the people, but also the businesses, which some of them are working working really hard to, to make it happen. So thank you to all of you, especially the speakers, but also all the participants for spending your time with us today. And we'll be sharing the recording of this with you very shortly. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, goodbye.